Hello, everybody. I'm Safiri Trudeau, and it is the 16 days of activism against gender based violence. And today I'm so happy to be talking to shelter movers because I have collaborated with this amazing organization, which offers it's a volunteer based run organization, and it's been up and running since 2016, and they're helping women who are um, experiencing domestic abuse to find a new place and to get out of the cycle of abuse. Uh, they can help you move, they can help you store. And we have two amazing courageous women with us today. Uh, the director of operations from Shelter Movers. And by the way, they have offices in Montreal, Waterloo, Vancouver, Nova Scotia and Ottawa. And uh, they do amazing work. So Yael Schwartz is the uh, director of uh, national operations. And we have already a very outspoken, very uh, inspiring woman who um, was lucky enough to have shelter movers in her life when she faced a difficult situation and knows exactly what she's talking about with shelter movers because she's, you know, she's lived the whole experience. And that is Ashwa Ayeko. So Yael Schwartz, as the Director of Operations for Shelter Movers, what can you tell us about what's been happening right now during this pandemic? Because people are, you know, stuck at home in different ways. And if there's a case of abuse, then it becomes much more difficult to, to get out. So tell us what you're seeing right now. Yeah, that's exactly right, Sophie. What an excellent question. So thank you for asking that. So I do think that almost all of us have a bit of a negative visceral reaction to just 2020 <laughs> when we hear it. But I have to say that for Shelter Movers, 2020 has been defined by adapting to new challenges, as well as a mix of planned and some unexpected growth. <laughs> so our priority, of course, always is the safety of survivors and volunteers on our moves. And we, since we are deemed an essential service, we've continued to operate with, with quite high demand at this time. And accordingly, we have been pretty agile and quick to develop our extensive COVID protocols and procedures to source PPE to continue to operate during this time. And to speak to the growth just a little bit, um, that despite the hurdles that definitely come with operating during this pandemic, we have pursued expanding to two new locations, to Montreal and Waterloo. And we're honestly yeah. so thrilled that we're able to be reaching more clients, especially at this heightened time of need, by opening these new chapters, as we know that this current crisis definitely exacerbates existing inequalities and also worsens the abuse for those who are already experiencing it. What's the one thing you've heard from, from women and their families? The one thing that you keep in mind during these times? So we know exactly as you pointed before that isolation is both trigger, triggering and directly limiting um, any client or any survivor's options for any reprieve, any time, any space away often from their abuser. Um, and this honestly does directly increase the incidence of violence or assault cases that we are seeing. And it is directly why we are experiencing a higher demand for our service too. And, and um, Ajwa, you have experienced firsthand, um, you know, violence and abuse, and you've been quite vocal about it. And I want to salute that because by sharing our stories, we allow others to do the same. Can you tell us a little bit about what you went through? What was domestic abuse for you? Well, um, it was a nightmare, um, to, to put it bluntly, it was a nightmare. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I am proud to say that um, it's been two years since I escaped, and I call it an escape because it was an imprisonment. Imagine being imprisoned within your own home. Um, it was a process that I, uh, that I entered um, under the under the premise that, you know, this is a new relationship, a loving relationship, a partner that I'm building with a safe space. And that quickly became, um, that quickly became a very, a very debil a debilitating relationship. Um, it did not start with physical abuse. People always, you know, ask, you know, ask women like, well, the first time, you know, he put his hand on you or whatever. Why didn't you leave? It never starts like that. It's a so how did it problem. start? How does it start? How did it start for you? How did you notice? For me, use? yeah, for me, definitely, uh, especially in retrospect, there were red flags from the beginning. Um, like it started off. It started off with um, we were put together um, by two mutual family members. Funny enough, those family members also came from long-term abusive relationships. 
the correlation was strong, but I didn't connect at that time. So when I met him, he was in a place where he was just grieving the death of his mother. So I attributed his moods to it's grief, it's grief, it's grief, be compassionate, be, you know, be kind, be loving, be the supporting part, supportive partner you need to be. And then it would increase to um, arguments that would end with a, a strong grip on my arm, um, being shaken a bit. And in my mind, I was just saying, you know, this is somebody who I have to be there, I have to be strong for him. But in the back of my head, especially as a former professional social service provider, I would say to myself, these are red flags. This is not okay. This is not normal. Okay, I'm going to stop you here just because what you said is so important. The face of domestic abuse and violence, there's still so much stigma. You would never think, oh, you know, this woman who works in the industry would be abused herself and would yes. not even see it. It can happen to anyone. Continue. Yes. I I'm so glad you made that point because I try to express to people that, um, you know, it, when you're outside of the situation, it's easy to say, well, well, that was the first sign you should have noticed from then. Um, I'm somebody who's trained to see those things. And for me, it never was presented as abuse. It was presented as my partner whom I love is grieving, needs support, is acting out. And um, this is a time where we need to, uh, you know, exude empathy and those type of things. It very quickly escalated into other forms of abuse that were so subtle, but became the norm that, it, that in my mind, I didn't translate it as abuse. Very financial, things like, uh, you know, uh, to take care of a household, it's time for the monthly bills to be paid. Oh, I, I, I don't have the money. I don't, you know, this person is working, but I don't have the money. So you'll have to come through with it and this and that. Okay, that's what you do for your partner. But it very quickly became, there is never any money yet when you're working. So I started to be in a pattern where I'm suffering financially, but both of us are working. And now I'm diagnosed with a chronic illness and can't work. And that- Can I ask, was door. that illness related to what you were living or not at all? Do you think it was triggered by- Definitely, you've got it right there. So um, I'll, I'll be transparent. So I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, you know, um, ulcers on the colon the biggest yeah. the biggest trigger stress factor so I would go into these flare-ups where um, in, in for example in 2017 I went from in January of 2017 175 pounds which is my normal weight strong girl to in June I was 100 <laughs> to in June I was 140 pounds 175 wow. to 140 because I couldn't even eat I couldn't retain okay. food um, my body rejected everything because I'm living with this, for lack of a better term, terrorist in my home. And I have nowhere to go because at this time, I have been isolated from my friends and family. So there's nobody who's even aware that what, what's happening. Sometimes people see me and say, oh, what's that, that bruise? Or, you know, what's that on you? And I say, oh, you know, I fell or, you know, whatever. Can I ask you there, so how does that work when you start being isolated from your friends and family? It doesn't happen from one day to the other. Was he saying things like, well, they don't, they don't even love you? Or like, how did he manipulate that? Because sometimes it's, it's quite pervasive. It's quite subtle. Oh, yes. So um, once again, it would be tied to his grieving process and his personal feelings. So he would say, so I'm West African, you know, so we in our culture, uh, we have a party for everything. You've paid the mortgage, let's have a house party. <laughs> let's get together, let's cook. Uh, you know, cousins come over and that's how I grew up. And so um, I would always have them over at the house and then he would say, oh, you know, today I'm just not feeling well. It's the date um, that my mother has passed or this or that. And, you know, I'm not feeling like having family around or that person, you know, I, I don't like the way that they look at me. And I would say to myself, I would have the war within my mind. Like, no, this is my... My cousin, who in our culture is, there's no, we don't have a word for cousin in our culture, it's sister, it's like a sibling. Um, they're now your family, why? Why is there this like discord? And then I would start to think, no, you know what? I'm going to be the good, the good wife. Um, so sorry, you know, not today, everybody coming over, you know, he's not feeling well, this and that, until it became such a pattern that that toxic cycle actually became a norm. It felt normal and it was no, people stopped calling. So Stop. I don't know if, if this will resonate, but maybe pe people will feel this. You are constantly making excuses for the person who was abusing you. Right, right. right. And um, 
the, the and it, um, it was coming from me, literally. So the explanations I would have to devise, like today, why we're not having anybody over, or today, why uh, ha why I haven't responded to a phone call in like two weeks, and you know, it would never be him having direct communication with the person and saying this is you know what I've expressed or whatever. So my family started to see that oh. I'm being withdrawn, you know, there must be something wrong with me. And I couldn't disclose um, what was happening because, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, these stigmas, I come from a community where we don't discuss our dirty laundry outside. Um, we don't, we, we want to present a, a very strong face to the world. So put your chin up, swallow it and um, keep moving forward. So that's what unfortunately I had to live through. So here's the thing, every human being on this planet has dirty laundry, right? Um, and, <laughs> right. and the more, and, and the more <laughs> we, uh, we face our truth as we talk about the, the real stuff and face our own truth, uh, that's our path to healing. Um, Ashwa, what was your darkest moment? What was the most difficult time? Can you remember? Uh, I, I can never forget. I can never forget. Um, there was a moment where I had family come in from out of town and um, <clears throat> I don't want to cry because it's okay because I'll cry too just cry <laughs> yeah <laughs> no more tears for it I had family come from out of town so they were staying at a hotel and this was in um, 2018 mm -hmm. in October and uh, it was time to go I have to go and see my aunt let's hurry up let's get breakfast the argument started because of oatmeal of all things but of course it has nothing to do with the oatmeal it has to do with the what's going on in 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 his mind and I remember being in the bedroom and I was yelling and saying she has to leave later today let's hurry up and go and he came in the bedroom and it's like a you know when something is happening and it's like I, I'm I it's like watching a movie because this thing cannot be my reality. Mm -hmm. He came towards me and he used his hand to drive me back against the wall of my throat. And nobody had ever um, put their hand on me like that before. I didn't grow, I grew up in a very normal two parent home. My parents never even like yelled at each other. They, they were best friends. We don't, I, I, I didn't experience something like that before used his hand to push me up against the wall and was choking me. And the one thing that I will never forget that is the one thing that I want to eventually be able to forget is his, I don't know how to say it, his eye was bigger inside. He's, he's choking me and his eyes are growing bigger. And I'm looking at him and I'm saying, this can't be my partner. This can't be him. Luckily enough, um, if you're religious, call it God, call it whatever. Um, I got the strength to push him off. And I was, I was um, so grateful for the opportunity to do that because this was the time where I was at my most ill. I was 140 pounds. I was constantly in and out of the hospital, bleeding a lot. I didn't have, if you look at me, my hands would be shaking like normally. But I got the strength to push him off. And as soon as I did that, I went outside because I knew that uh, you know, the type of person who's keeping up appearances, he won't do anything to me outside. And I luckily I had my phone on me and I called my family who was close to come to the house. Um, and that was my, that was one of two of the worst incidences. The other one was the day that I was making him exit my property and he tackled me like a football player on the left side, right here where the colon is. And he tackled me and I started bleeding right away and I had to fight him physically to get him out of the house. And those are the two moments that always replay in my mind during the days that are, I don't feel as strong, but I'm um, very, very grateful that um, I survived to, to tell that tale. You know? we, we are very grateful as well because we need you. We need you to uh, empower so many other girls and women who, uh, who are experiencing this. Um, yeah. When did you decide this is enough? I can't, I can't, I just can't. The day that he tackled me, the day that he tackled me. Um, you know, if you've ever watched like, I mean, 
I don't watch football, but I see like sometimes like when they're doing practice, there's like a big uh, styrofoam thing yes. and they run and, and they, they push it. Into, yeah. Yes. Yes. He did like that standing in our living room. And when we went down and we hit the floor and I hit the floor and I said to, I remember saying to myself in my head, if you don't get him out, you're, you're not getting out. Mm-hmm. And this was after, um, between the, the choking time and this time, uh, everything in between was like a little push here, a slip and fall here. There was even a time where he was trying to leave with my property, leave the home at one time. And he was trying to drive the car and was, um, I was holding on to him and he was driving the car. So I was like having to drag with the car, not drag bodily, but just like run with it. And I had to let go. And then I say to myself, like, this can't happen. This is not your life because that would happen in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I'm teaching at a women's conference about empowerment and about being strong and about being safe. And the, the, the irony, the, the guilt, the hypocrisy, I decided that day, if you don't get him out, you're not going to get out of this. And funny enough, sorry, you're going to say it? No, it's just when you talk about guilt, I think a lot of women, uh, you know, I- including me, including everybody, we live with, with a lot of guilt. It's as if it's never enough, we're never enough, we've got to do more. I think people will relate to this yep. because it's a constant battle. Why do you think we live with so much guilt? Why? You know, I, I think as, as women, a lot is put on our shoulders. We put a lot on our own shoulders. Um, we are the, I remember we always used to laugh at my parents in our house and say, our dad is the head of the home, but my mom is the heart. If she's not happy, nobody's happy. The women are the center of the home, right? And with that comes a lot of responsibility. The facade to um, present a brave and a strong and a put together face. Um, And at that time I had become both of our caregivers emotionally. Mm -hmm. And um, it got to the point where it was so debilitating that I would have like panic attacks. I remember always going to the hospital. Like I had to, um, what is it called? Run on the treadmill thing, the test, the EKG and test like that, whatever, because my heart, yeah, my heart was literally beating in my ears. And I was saying to my doctor, something is wrong. And all the tests came back other than, you know, the colitis clear, nothing is wrong with you. What, what my body was doing was exhibiting all of the stress and the trauma I was going through. So when it got to that day where he told me, I said, enough is enough. And I, I threw him out and it was a three hour process. So you, you packed your bags. What did you do? You went to shelter movers. How did that work? Like, like technically, what did you do? Mm-hmm. So I said to myself, um, it's, it was my property and I'm not going anywhere. So what I did is I was very strategic. Um, once again, having the training, the, um, I want to thank the city of Toronto, the, the uh, nonviolence um, safety training, being able to defuse the situation. What I did is that the, 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 the possessions that he prized the most, I picked them up and I put them outside. So he would go there and go and pick. And as soon as he was outside, doors locked, everything safe, and it became a standoff. And then I had, um, you know, friends who were police officers on the phone, like, okay, we're coming over. And funny enough, it, after that standoff, he ended up driving away and I sat down on the floor and I said, like, I'm now that I'm technically safe, I can break down. I lay on the floor and I cried for about five hours straight. Oh. I lay on my kitchen floor yeah. and I didn't know what to do next because I knew I had to get out. But at that time, because of the the financial abuse and because of the high expenses with caring for myself health wise, I had nothing in my account. Mm-hmm. And, but then I remembered, so I have a, a little organization, like a sisterhood of women, and um, it's like a little empowerment circle. Mm-hmm. And I remembered that on, online, I had seen um, that there was this group called Shelter Movers that helps women. So I remember I put it in the group. We have a Facebook group. If anybody needs this, you don't need to be, you don't need to respond. But if anybody does need this information, these are people who will help you move. Um, when you're trying to escape domestic violence, I'm sharing this resource. Sharing it as a resource while I'm going through it, not connecting that sister, this is what you need to do for yourself. And when I was laying on the floor and, and I said out loud to myself, I don't know what to do. I just opened my phone and I'm scrolling social media 
and then in the feed, somebody had um, bumped it, meaning saw it and liked it. So it came up in the feed again. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna call. And when I called, I always say, it literally changed and saved my life because I did not have anywhere to go and I did not have the resources. If I had stayed, I would have died. I would not be here. So I called them and it, it, it was the anchor for me to escape. It became, it, it became so much more than just moving to the point where now it's like they're my family because they literally saved my life. Yeah, Al, you're hearing this story, um, you know, Ajwa's story that you're familiar with. And uh, I like, uh, Ajwa, that you, you use the word anchor, because from what I've seen, I've collaborated with shelter movers. I've, 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 I've met some people who have moved, you know, through shelter movers and heard some stories. And I think that's what shelter movers become is an anchor, is this uh, tribe, this community of people who become family. Um, Yael, how do you think think shelter movers changes women's life when they go through this cycle of, of domestic abuse and trying to get out because uh, you know Ajwa was was the owner of her own home but what if when there's women who have nothing and they have you know no no room to go to go back to mm -hmm. how does that work it's an excellent question and thank you Ajwa as, as many times that I've heard your story there's I can never hear it and feel it too many times. And so thank you always for sharing all of that. Um, and definitely, I think that the anchor piece is a great way to think of it. I also love to highlight that every single one of our clients' circumstances, situations, stories is completely unique. And as such, the service that we're providing them, I think will mean a different thing and will we'll mark a different part of their journey as well. Um, and I think that that's important, but I think that ultimately the few things that we are trying to support with um, in a real way in these circumstances are to provide some experience of empowerment in a time where a lot is stripped and is, has been stripped away and, and going back to a home or leaving a home with some of your belongings or all of your belongings or whatever belongings you choose you want can actually have a pretty remarkable impact. And we see that all the time with our moves. Um, that, that in a time where you feel like so much has been taken away to be able to come back and say, this is mine and this is, and I'm taking it with me is, is really tremendously powerful. And to speak also to Ajwa's point, the, the, one of the specific barriers that we are trying to address with our service is the financial barrier of leaving a, a, any type of abuse or, or, or domestic violence situation. Um, and it's only one of many, many barriers that exist, right? But it's, it's, it's one that, that's pretty um, significant. And so for us to be what, able what to- What are the top five barriers that women face when it comes to the cycle of domestic abuse? Top five. Oof, top five barriers would definitely be social isolation. And, and it's so heightened right now, right? And, and it's such a real way. Um, so financial um, instability or um, lack of being able to even access, access finances a lot of the time. Um, the other barriers are often when it comes to a client who has children, um, they're at the top of the list, right, of course. Um, and they, they're kind of a constant barrier every day. Somebody is thinking about leaving a situation. One that people don't expect often is pets. Um, pets are one of the top, often three reasons actually, that are stated for why clients, often women will stay in, in situations that are violent is for fear of what might happen to their pet. Often uh, abuse to, to a woman, uh, say, for, for the most part, will also be linked to abuse of a pet. And so there's there's a fear of, of leaving that pet behind, what, what, what would happen to them. Um, and I don't know what number I'm at now. Um, but an employee what about the emotional component, the emotional, you know, uh, prison that Absolutely. doesn't seem to be able to, to, to can get out of? Without a doubt, the emotional, the psychological barrier of just not not seeing a way out, I think, and, and I think Ajwa could speak to it much much more eloquently than I from her experience, but I think that not not seeing a way out, I think anytime a door is cracked open just a little bit, like you hear about shelter movers or you hear about another agency that's trying to support women and, and anyone who's in this circumstance, it, it gives you like a brief moment of pause from the reality that you're so embedded in and and exactly as Ajo says you kind of see it from that third party perspective right and you're you kind of have a moment of 
okay, maybe I need to, to reevaluate or maybe there are other options. And so I think, I think definitely without a doubt, the emotional or psychological barrier to even start thinking about leaving, right? There's, there's always an option and there's always allies along the way. This is, this is the message. Um, and also, you know, the guilt and the shame that uh, women have to carry about, oh my God, this is happening to me. You know, I have to move out, I have to go away, but I'm the one being abused uh, is also so strong. Um, Ajwa, how did that weigh on you? For me, um, for me at that moment, um, throughout the duration of the abuse, that was the one thing that, um, other than the financial piece, which is huge, um, which that was the part that made me stay, I said to myself, I. I can't afford to end this relationship and then I'll be alone. And then my, my family, like, what will they think? Um, I've established myself as somebody who is now partnered and um, I, can't, I can't do it I can, because he has completely stripped me of my identity, of my emotional strength, of my physical strength. Um, and I started to feel like even in this horrible stage, situation, it's all I have and nothing without it until, you know, thank God the wake up call, because unfortunately not every woman gets the opportunity to have that aha moment and choose to leave, some leave forever, you understand? And so for me, it was deciding that I, I even though I didn't necessarily feel that I, I love myself more than than this, the facade of this relationship. And when I, when I had him exit, I just needed the minute to breathe. I knew that it was, even though it was my property, it's a place that I cannot stay. And I just like prayed for a door to be open. And luckily a family member said, this is my place here. There's a place for you. And that's where shelter movers came in. And for me, I would, had gotten to the point where I was so isolated from everybody that now it's like, oh my God, these strangers are coming. And yes, they're helping me, but I'm terrified because, you know, some of them, there are men, they're coming here. And then uh, uh, of course, being a black woman, I'm like, you know, these people are not from my community. I feel scared. I feel isolated. I feel alone. And I still remember the day that they came, they met me um, a little bit away from the house, just in case for safety reasons. And when I was walking up to them, it looked like just a bunch of people from my high school. Just, you know, just hanging around waiting. And I, like within two, I'm walking up and I'm scared. I'm already crying. I already have my, my, my things prepared to say, like, this is not really who I am. This is not how I am. I really am a good person. And in 10 minutes, they had me laughing. They had me like telling stories of like, oh, where did you go to high school? This and that, whatever. And, and they, they treated my property with so much respect the dignity that I had been robbed of in the situation, sorry, oh, my eyeliner, the dignity that I had been robbed of in the situation was so um, generously restored. Um, they acted like I had paid them thousands to pack my stuff, so gentle. Do you want this here? Giving me back the, um, the choice of what happens in my life. And for me, that was the beginning of a healing process and helped me in the catalyst to say that regardless of what happens in the future, I'm going to make sure that it's now my life's work to help other women, to let them know about resources like that, to let them know that there is, there is life after this and to reclaim your identity. So, Ajwa, you yeah. said you chose the love that you had for yourself over an, anything else, right? And when you choose you in life and you reach out, people will choose you too. People are mostly good. And when you decide to choose yourself, yeah. you can change your whole life. Yes. And you did. Yes, well said. Well said, well said, yeah. It was definitely... Um, the turning point that I needed yeah. um, to be in a new space physically and then a new headspace. And the he what what was poignant to the healing process was made. Well, I mean the healing process is still a journey. I'm still on it. But what was made 
um, what made it so much easier is that knowing that while I tried to figure out how to pull myself together, how to get my health back in store, my stuff, my prized possessions, things that I had had since childhood, because in our family, we, we, we hoard, we don't let anything go. I had things from kindergarten. It's, it's, <laughs> they're safe. My, my, what I have, the only thing I have left in my life is safe with shelter movers. Um, and that gave me so much peace of mind because I didn't have to worry about lugging around all these things and what's going to happen to it. Am I going to lose anything else? My father had just died a couple months before. So I had some of his heirlooms and belongings and everything was precious to me. So it was literally like go, the it's, uh, morning, the death of my father, then morning, the death of my relationship, then morning, the death of, you know, my home. So this, these multiple layers of grief and, Shelter Movers provided these pockets of reprieve. I can breathe when it comes to this thing. I can breathe when it comes to that thing, so. Yeah. And, and Ajwa, you also touched on something that's quite delicate because there's still a lot of stigma around it, but we have to talk about the real stuff. But as a woman of color, do you think that there is stigma around you know, domestic abuse and, and women of color right here in our own country? I um, 100% certify that there is. Um, in in, in many communities. That's a that's a great question. Um, growing up, funny enough, I had many many extended family members who were involved in abusive relationships. And as a child, even as a child living within the family, I wasn't aware of them until after growing into womanhood would hear stories. And it's because uh, there was this shame that we have to uh, keep this face. We are immigrants in this country. And we have to do our best and present our best. And so that would in turn cause, jeopardize, you know, women who were in these situations in my family to continue to stay because God forbid somebody sees me as less than or unpartnered or I failed. And I definitely think now being in a place where I am, I am giving myself the goal every day to reclaim my power how I change it is awareness, very outspoken. There is nothing to be, um, whereas before it may have been viewed as, oh, that happened to you, that's horrible, that's so shameful. Now it's a, it's a place of empowerment for me because I got out, I chose to get out, I survived, I'm strong and I'm okay and I'm not, and I'm thriving, like I'm, I'm okay. And whatever okay means, like for me, okay is like, I'm happy, I laughed today, I feel safe the comfort of sleeping and not feeling scared at night, those things are all wins for me. So I'm very vocal. Awareness is how I think we change it. Being very vocal, being supportive, providing safe spaces for, for women. Um, it, you know, for me, I've had other family members reach out and say, well, you know how it is with us. Like we don't talk about these things. And I feel and saying, no, 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 you're the strongest person I know. Um, you're, you're now an example for other people who are in this situation. So giving it a sense of normalcy to choose to survive is how I would say we can begin to address these issues in not just communities of culture, but everywhere. And talking about culture, um, last question before we slowly wrap up, but it's really important. Uh, obviously, Shelter Movers is out there to help all the, you know, the, the women and their families who are, who are stuck um, and who are scared and uh, who need to know that there is help out there. And the minute you reach out, things will start getting better. But, um, you know, the perpetrators and the, and the men mostly who, who, who abuse, um, with a bit of, of perspective, what do you think we can do in our own culture, how we raise our own boys and men around us to prevent this? It is super important. Um, I, for me, uh, I think for me personally, that education definitely begins at home. Um, teaching, teaching the importance of gender equality, um, teaching our boys and our men to deal with women with grace. Um, with a little bit more love um, because a lot of, a lot of, I know in my case, uh, 
for him, that was the pathology in his family, abuse, next generation abuse, next generation. So breaking those cycles is super important, super so important, providing do our- can, Do you think we can break those cycles by also, you know, obviously helping victims constantly, and, and I don't wanna say victims, but people who are, you know, at the hands of, of abuse, and also letting the boys and men express what is repressed because in your case and in many other stories we see so much anger and and sadness that is bottled up and that comes out in aggression right 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 yeah definitely providing um even speaking to the mental health piece providing um the opportunity for you know men and boys to express that i'm not okay something is wrong um giving them spaces to resolve the pain that manifests as anger, um, allowing them to see that there, sh there is and there should be a normalcy with seeking support for mental health, um, providing that awareness to all communities. It should be as normal as going to the spa. And I know for women, like I know with me and my girlfriends, we love talking. Yes, we love yes. talking about going to our therapist and then we're gonna go get our nails done. It's very normal, but for men, where do they go to cry? Who do they lean on? Especially when they're coming from circles where it's just toxicity and it's not, oh, men are not supposed to cry or be weak. And that's, that's, that is what is contributing to this. It, COVID is not the only pandemic that we have. Can you uh, tell us if anybody wants to volunteer because can you, uh, can you tell us, how do, how do we volunteer with child removers? It's easy, so let us yes, know. Yes, absolutely, thank you so much for this question. <laughs> I love it. So yes, as we continue to grow and experience growth as in child removers, we're always looking for more volunteers um, in any of the cities that we operate, so I'll just list them again. Uh, we're in Toronto, we're in Ottawa, Vancouver, um, the Halifax area um, and Montreal recently and Waterloo as well, just as of this week. <laughs> um, and so if you do visit our website, sheltermovers.com, it's very easy. You look, uh, just hop over to the Get Involved tab and there's a simple form you can fill out. One of our volunteer coordinators will be in touch with you super quickly. And I do have to say that our volunteers are the best. <laughs> and I also feel that um, as myself, I think our volunteers get hooked on volunteering for shelter movers, to be honest. Um, I did as well. And I think the one thing that we hear over and over from our volunteers about why they enjoy volunteering with shelter movers is really that they can have a tangible, like a real effect um, to support somebody like Ajwa. And we hear this over and over again. And, and it's the reason why our volunteers are as committed as they are. And I also have to say that during this time where maybe like 95% of our lives are virtual. Um, it's still a way that you can have a hands-on frontline really impact in your own community. And there are, you know, those opportunities are pretty slim these days. So uh, we'd love, we'd love to have the support. Well, you, you all have wings. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you for your presence. We are all allies on this path for more quality. So sending you lots of loves and to all your loved ones as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for everything. <laughs> Thank you.